Good evening, we're gonna wait a few minutes. Good evening, we're gonna wait a few minutes to let folks join. Good evening and welcome to tonight's event, Zooming to Success, Leveraging Virtual Technology for Career Growth and Development. We're excited to be hosting this event to share tips and strategies to boost your career using modern technology. My name is Beth Downey and I'm the Chief Information Officer at Newton Wellesley Hospital and I'm also the co-chair of our Workforce Development Council. I will be the moderator for tonight's event and I'm so excited that you've been able to join us. We would like to start things off with a quick poll of our attendees to get an idea of our audience this evening. So we're going to launch the poll now. If you can fill out a couple of questions, this will give our panelists an idea of who's attending tonight's session. So while we're doing the poll, I'll continue on with my introduction. Um, so tonight's event is hosted by the Newton Wellesley Hospital Workforce Development Council, which is part of our Newton Wellesley Hospital Community Collaborative. The Workforce Development Council was formed with a commitment to improving career opportunities, especially with area youth. The goal of the council is to expand potential career options in the community in the hopes of enhancing family financial security and helping to have a strong pool of talented people such as yourselves to work at local businesses. All of this ultimately translates to improved health and wellness for our community as a whole. Tonight's event is another opportunity for us to provide information that can assist you in your career development. Tonight, we are fortunate to have an amazing keynote speaker who will review various topics, including virtual networking, how to leverage online platforms such as LinkedIn, and how to master the virtual interview to land the job. The keynote will be broken into two sections and we'll have panel discussions after each of the sections. Thank you everyone for filling out the poll. I appreciate that. Um, we will also be taking questions from the attendees um, in, during each panel discussion. So I want to encourage you to submit any question that you have to the panelists using our Q&A function. And then when we get to the panel section, I will pose those questions to our panelists. So I would now like to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, Emily Neal is the Senior Managing Director from John Half Executive Search. So I'm going to hand it over to Emily to introduce herself and then begin the first half of her keynote. So welcome, Emily. Thank you, Beth. Hi, uh, Beth told you I am Emily Neal. It's actually Robert Half, not John, but I can understand the, <laughs> the mix up. Those are My two incredible names. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm a senior managing director in our executive search practice. Uh, why does that matter here? Because I spend pretty much all day, every day on video, either interviewing candidates or speaking with clients or networking. So I think that I have a, a pretty good amount of subject matter expertise on these topics that we are going to cover this this evening. And I'm going to do my very best to make this the best hour of your lives. So <laughs> why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, so as Beth mentioned, uh, we're going to cover networking, LinkedIn, and interviewing. And I'm going to give you a lot of examples, a lot of tips. So I hope you have a pen and some paper so you can write this down. I will say this is being recorded and uh, will be available for view after. So if we, uh, let's see if I can advance here are. What is networking? What is the concept of networking? Well, 
It is the process of making connections and building relationships. It is also an exchange of information and ideas among people with a common profession or special interest. Without networking, we really wouldn't know who each other is. I wouldn't know who Beth is. I wouldn't know who the other panelists are. Networking is important. So what are different types of networks? Well, I've got to tell you, there's not just one type of network. Different people may have multiple types of networks. The most common is professional. For example, people with whom you work, or if you are in your career and advance a little further, you may be on a board of directors. These are all professional networks, people that you are connected to through something, your work, a nonprofit organization, or some other means of a professional gathering. But, whoop, hello. We have a very temperamental mouse here. <laughs> oh boy, you got to see the whole presentation before it even started. Here we go. Personal networks are also really important. And what many of you, especially those in high school, probably have, and you don't even know it. Social groups can be a network, people with whom you are in a sport, or if you're in a drama club, or maybe you're part of a religious group, a synagogue, or a church group. There can be parent groups. Uh, for example, I live in Natick, and there's a, a parent group on Facebook called Natick Moms. So if I have a question that I want to ask, like maybe I'll go on to Facebook and say, hey, uh, I'm looking for a new pediatrician. Does anybody have a suggestion? That's a network I can tap into. Uh, there are also alumni groups and alumni isn't only college. It can be high school alumni as well. There are also alumni from uh, uh, child care facilities, people that grew up in a certain child care facility and they get together, they have ever since they were three years old. So networks can be groupings of people from a lot of different areas. So why is this important? Well, I want you to think about how a network is set up. A network is kind of like a spider web, if you can visualize it, and I hope you don't mind spiders, but it starts in the middle with the, the beginning of the web, and then it builds out little branches. So that's the start of different people that you know, building this network. And then that branches out to other people who know other people that you may not know directly, but there's just only one step, one connection in between the two of you. And it just builds out more and more and more until you have literally a web of people that are somehow connected to each other. And they say that in life, each of us is connected um, through six of those different steps, six degrees of separation. So if we were all going to try to map this out somehow in some way I am connected perhaps to all of you via six different types of people so that's a pretty cool uh, thought uh, some people call it six degrees of Kevin Bacon uh, but we'll we'll stick to um, <laughs> six degrees of separation so why is this important well, First of all, you get to expand the number of connections that you have, which can only help you. It can help you in your personal life. Uh, if you need help with something or you wanna try to get into a restaurant and somebody knows the general manager, it can also be important for your professional career by broadening your skills and knowledge through getting to know other people. And also perhaps more importantly for this conversation, learning about industry news, including job opportunities. Opportunities. So what are the different ways to network? This isn't all of the different ways, but these are the ways that you're probably most familiar with. In-person events, those are really starting to come back. If you're in the high school uh, age range, there could be career fairs, college fairs. That's a great way to meet people, get their names, and, and start to keep in touch with them for future opportunities or future college aspirations. You can do breakfasts or lunches or dinners, uh, in some cases, cocktail receptions, uh, where, where there are either facilitated around a guest speaker or just a meet and greet. And then, of course, conferences, conventions, all great ways to meet people in person. Well, virtual events like this one can also be a great way to get to know people. This is a seminar, a webinar, if you will, so there's not as much interaction, but some webinars do have what are called breakout rooms where you can connect with different people. 
and get to know who they are. We don't have time for that today, but you are going to get to know who five or six of us are. So these virtual events can be really, really empowerful, empowering, I'm sorry, and powerful. And then finally, leveraging social media tools. Uh, we all know what social media is, and the most well-known tool for networking is called LinkedIn, and we're going to get to that in a moment. So I think you all know you can leverage social media to do a whole bunch of things. You can share updates and ideas and information. You can post. You can view multimedia. You can network with other professionals. And for this purpose today, perhaps most importantly, build your personal brand. I want to say one thing, though. You have to be careful about what you post or share. I tell you, I have candidates that have not gotten a job because they posted something offensive or they retweeted something offensive or there was some affiliation in their background that some felt wouldn't be appropriate to their, their job. So I want to urge you, especially those of you that are new in your careers or about to be leaving high school and going into careers, People look at your social media. They can find ways to access, uh, for, for those that are a little more aged like me, Facebook, uh, Instagram. I know there's Snapchat and a whole bunch of other means. Well, you think that nobody can find a way to it? Trust me, people can figure out a way to it. So just be very, very careful on what you post or share. Let's talk about LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the world's largest professional networking site more than 830 million members in 230 countries. For me, the biggest takeaway I want you to have today about LinkedIn is that it is your brand. I'm gonna show you an example of what a LinkedIn profile looks like, and then we're gonna actually walk through mine real time. But when you look at the LinkedIn profile as a professional, it tells everything about you that I need to know. It starts with a picture. Then there's a whole section about you. And we're gonna encourage you to use keywords or words that closely identify who you are and what type of role or job you might be looking for. And there's a lot more to this profile, but I'm gonna stop a moment here and share with you what mine looks like, and then we can uh, walk through it specifically. So give me one second while I switch screens and share this. Okay, this is my LinkedIn profile. I have been doing this a long time. So I think I have a pretty good LinkedIn profile, but this is all just my opinion of the things I'm gonna share with you. Uh, there are different views on how you should set up a LinkedIn profile. I probably look at 50 to 100 of these a day, and I have a pretty good sense of what others may be looking for. So LinkedIn profiles can be good if you wanna just look somebody up, like who's this Emily Neal person that I just met? Go to LinkedIn and check them out. Sometimes I might be at a sporting event and somebody says, oh, that's so-and-so's mom, blah, blah, blah. And I think, oh, that name sounds familiar. I will go to LinkedIn and see who they are. Maybe I'm trying to get a job and I wanna go find out who the president of a certain company is. You can find out on LinkedIn. So this is what we're gonna do really quickly. We're just gonna scroll through this and I'm gonna give you some tips and then we'll come back to this in a bit. So first and foremost, you have to, if you're going to put up a headshot or a photo, it's got to be good. It has to be good. I don't wanna see you in a wedding picture and your arm was around somebody and in this picture, you've cut your arm short and it's just you standing there holding a glass of beer or something inappropriate for a professional profile. Most people will take their iPhone and maybe do a portrait shot on their iPhone. Those come out so nicely. You can go out in front of a tree or something and blur the background on portrait. Those make the most beautiful shots. Or you can have it professionally done too. Many companies actually pay for this to be done. But you have to have a good headshot if you're going to have one up here. That tells me everything about you and how you view yourself and your brand. Up here, you're going to talk about who you are. Well, I'm an executive search expert across all industries. As you scroll down, you can tell about yourself. 
This one is pretty important because it allows people to really get almost a bio of who you are. And you don't have to be a seasoned professional. You can be somebody who is just graduating from high school. So you can say a uh, soon to be graduate who has passion in uh, running track and volunteering at my community center and just say a little bit about yourself. But that's really important and that'll change as you get on in your career. But most importantly, I think, is this section on experience. You've got to lay out for people what you do and make it as easy as possible for people to read. So you've got my title here, you've got my company, and I have a little blurb, if you will, about what my company does. So people don't have to look this up and go, what is this? And then I've got a few bullet points. Then I go down this next role here. I was president of Junior Achievement of Northern New England. I say right here what it is, because I bet a lot of you don't know what Junior Achievement is. So I have it right here so that people don't have to go look it up. And then bullet points. Bullet points to me are the easiest for, for people like me to scan to see what you've done. If you put big, long paragraphs, it makes it really hard to get through it quickly. And also, I just want to point out that you don't want too much on here because hopefully you have a resume. So this is just a screenshot, a tad bit less than what you have on your resume. So if you have maybe seven points on your resume, maybe here you just have three or four to give somebody a taste for what you do. And then it goes down. And then you're going to put in your education, whether it be high school or an associate's degree or whatever you have, you're going to put it here. And then really important, volunteering. Almost everyone volunteers in some way, shape, or form. And it's important that people know about that. So it doesn't look like it's all about you. It's really good to show that you give back to others. It's also a really good way to connect with other people. I talk to people who are involved in junior achievement chapters all over the United States. And it's a good connection point to uh, have an icebreaker for conversation. So I'm gonna stop the screen share here. And I'm gonna go back to what I just described on the slideshow. And then uh, we're gonna get going on the, the first Q&A. So again, for LinkedIn, really, really important. You, you put the time and effort into this. It is your brand. Just like Nike has a logo and a brand, you have a brand and this is it. So high quality photo or headshot, complete the about section, the summary. Make sure you use targeted keywords or words that are closely aligned with what you want people to know about you. If you are in the financial services world, maybe you put something in there about trading or different um, certifications and things that you have. If you're a high school student, maybe you are an expert in history or you did AP math, something like that. Put keywords in there that you think that people might want to see that really talk about you. You're gonna highlight your experience in a resume style. As I mentioned, I prefer that you don't do big paragraphs, put in volunteering, Oh my goodness, make sure somebody looks this over for you. Nothing is worse than spelling and grammatical errors because again, it's your brand. And what that tells me is you're a little sloppy. You don't pay attention to detail. So make sure that somebody looks it over for you. And last but not least, before you post it, fill it out completely. Make sure every piece is filled in so your brand doesn't look half complete. So I know I just crammed a lot into the first 15 minutes here, but we are now going to proceed and go to our first Q&A session. Excellent, thank you so much, Emily. Um, so I do wanna encourage any of our attendees, if you have any questions, please add them to the Q&A. We don't have any questions in there yet. Um, and I would now like to introduce our panelists. So um, very exciting. First, we have Kenna Thompson. Kenna, would you like to introduce yourself to the attendees? Sure. Good evening, everybody. My name is Kenna Thompson. Um, my background is in the hospitality industry. I started working with the cruise industry with Royal Caribbean International and segued into hospitality consulting in general, doing hotel and conference center development. And I now run a private equity partnership that uh, builds properties in both Massachusetts and Florida. And it's a pleasure to be with all of you tonight. Excellent, thank you. And our next panelist is Joel Gomez. Joel, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Beth. Uh, my name is Joel Gomez. I am a senior manager at Newton Wellesley Hospital. 
I manage the telecommunications department and also interpreter services. I volunteer for an organization called Prospanica, and I'm uh, the president of the Boston chapter, and also volunteer at Northern Essex Community College. I'm a trustee and, and also the chair for the alumni board. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Excellent. And you've all met Emily and we've been listening to all of her great information. Um, so I do have a few questions that I can pose to the group um, while we're waiting, but I do hope that our attendees will submit some questions in. Um, so I'll throw a few questions out and see who wants to answer them. Um, so let's see, how do each of you go about building your network and how have you done that? If anyone wants to start with that. I can take a stab at it. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that Emily mentioned uh, when talking about networking, uh, she said making connections and building, um, uh, basically about making connections to build your network. And, and part of what I think is important as you start to create your brand uh, is making sure that you reach out to those people that you think are going to make a difference and who you can learn from as well. Um, you know, part of what worked for me is as I attended some of the events uh, and, and I noticed, okay, who is going to be the speaker at this event? Uh, who is going to be there? Pick maybe two or three people that I wanted to connect with and make sure that I took a full advantage of the time, uh, you know, because it goes by very quickly. A lot of people may uh, take that time uh, speaking to that person. And, and, you know, so you want to leverage the time that you have there and make sure that you make that connection. Uh, but it starts before you get to the event, not when you get there. Yeah, I would build on on what Joel said and you build up your village and your village is going to build you up. So the more you can um, and, and don't think of it as being scary or intimidating to start talking to people. I think you'll find, as Emily said before, that it, it just takes a little bit of commonality and you'll realize, oh, do you know this person you worked? You you know, you were on that team. I I I. I played soccer with that person. Did you go to that field and play, you know, whatever it is, whether you're high school age, college age, or, or seasoned professional, you'll find you have more in common with people than you realize. And, and it's just a matter of talking a little bit and you find that spark and all of a sudden you hit it off and, and you can, you, you start to build that village up. Excellent. Well, we have a few questions that have come in from our attendees, so I will go to some of those questions. Uh, so the first one is, uh, when building a brand for yourself, is it considered unprofessional to be a bit artsy with it? Um, sort of where's the line? So Emily, I don't know if that one might be a good one. For yeah, you. well, what I would say to you on that is, if you're an art major, or if you're doing something in your career that is around art, be artsy. What I wouldn't do, however, is be artsy just to be artsy. Like if you want to go into banking, I would not do an artsy profile on LinkedIn. But if you want to go into acting or, or drawing or any music, something that really shows who you are, that's what your LinkedIn pro profile should reflect. So I hope that answers the question for whomever asked it. I think that's good. And I don't know if Kenna or Joel has anything you want to add to your experience with, with that. Oh, I think that's perfectly said. <laughs> okay, great. Excellent. Um, so the next question we have, how does a person start a network in an industry where they don't have any existing contacts, specifically thinking post high school grads and recent college grads? Good question. Probably take on that one. Um, you know, so, so uh, I, I'm an, an adult learner. I uh, went to college when I, I started, uh, went back to school when I was 37. And, um, you know, so what I, I did, I didn't have a LinkedIn account. And I said, okay, how do I do this? Well, where do I begin? And so I started attending um, uh, different conferences and, and webinars and um, just connecting with people, uh, letting them know my story, uh, where, you know, where, where I wanted to go. But at the same time, uh, you know, making that connection, because I think what you want to do is as you start to build your profile and to, to uh, build your information, it's also letting your story, uh, getting your story out there. So that people know exactly where you come from, what are some of the things that you want to do, uh, and finding that common ground. Uh, but I think also just kind of leveraging that um, time as well and making sure that you are letting them know that, hey, this is where I want to go, um, you know, and finding that, that uh, specific people that will be, make a difference and will make uh, that impact on your profile as well moving forward. Excellent. All right, Emily, do you want to add to that? 
No, I'll we'll go to the next question. Okay. So what tips do you have for beginning to develop your brand? Could you give some examples of different kinds of brands and how they relate to your personality, experience, career goals, et cetera? Kenna, you want to take that one? Um, so clarify just a little for me. So it, is it somebody that's that's just starting out, that's looking to, to build their identity in the industry? Yeah. So it said, what tips do you have for beginning to develop your brand? So beginning if you're, to develop. you're okay. just beginning so, to develop it. Yeah. So Some I'll, examples um, of maybe different kinds of brands of things that you've seen, how people are branding themselves. Sure. So it might have to do with specific industries you're looking in. So if, for instance, you're interested in healthcare, or you're interested in hospitality, um, that's where you want to try and focus. Maybe you start attending webinars specifically for those different industries. Um, there might be area um, gatherings in like an early evening or a coffee gathering in the morning somewhere um, with a potential workplace or um, volunteer groups where at somewhere where you want to, let's say you wanted to work at Newton Wellesley Hospital and there's a volunteer opportunity that you could look into. That's a way to start building your brand within that industry. Um, and it's, it is a matter of just taking baby steps into trying to find openings into something. Or maybe you're you're going to look for an internship or a job, but the only thing you can get is a bit of a shadow work first. Um, don't be afraid to take that because usually that kind of thing segues into an opportunity for work afterward. And, uh, Excellent. So jump into Go ahead, that. So volunteering goes uh, a long way. Uh, Very and, much so. And for me specifically, it opened, it opened up a lot of doors not only uh, professionally, but I also was able to get a full scholarship to go to school because mm -hmm. of volunteering uh, and, and learning information. So do not be afraid to sign up for any opportunity that you may see up there and leverage that opportunity as well. Could not agree more with that statement. Um, so sort of along those lines, do you think it's, um, do you encourage folks to go to in-person events now that the world is opened back up again? Um, or do you think digital networking is enough? or should it be a combination of the two? I can take that one. If you have the opportunity, I would absolutely make it a combination of the two. Uh, and a lot will depend on time. Uh, it'll depend on costs. It'll depend on what the event is. Nothing beats being in person with somebody. It's just real. And you, you can't get that real dimension through a camera. You get pretty close but it's just different. And it's also more difficult to meet more than one or two people at a time if you're only doing video networking. For example, I went to a luncheon on Friday, there were 1,100 people there, 1,100, maybe one of the biggest events that I've seen since COVID. I didn't meet all 1,100, but I tell you, I met more than two or three. <laughs> so pick your battles. If you are going to go to an event, make sure it is really worth your time. Make sure it is really worth the cost because you can't get that time back. So that's what I would encourage you to do. Just pick pick what is going to be the best use of your time and, and uh, resources and then decide from there if it's uh, if it makes sense. Yeah. And then I think as Joel had said before, do whatever homework you can ahead of time. Um, yeah. If the attendee list is there, you know who the keynote speakers are and if those mm -hmm. are folks that you want to try to connect with. Um, so when you are trying to connect with folks, I suppose building a, a virtual network, um, what's the best way to reach out to them? Should you email them, call people? What do you think? So I think, you know, Emily hit on, on this one uh, earlier and, and and you, you know, we have LinkedIn, which is amazing. It's an amazing tool. And so you can reach out to people in advance. You can introduce yourself, uh, make sure that they know who you are. Uh, you know, a brief description, maybe not your whole story, but something that will make a difference. So when you meet that person uh, or when you have the conversation, they say, oh, yeah, I remember you. Uh, and, and you just want to build that rapport. So when uh, the time comes, you know, you will stand out from the rest of the 11 or uh, 10, <laughs> 99 that are there. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Anyone have any other thoughts you want to share on networking? Oh, actually, we do have one more question that came in. Um, is it important to have 
that number of 500 plus connections on LinkedIn. My profile looks sad with a few connections I have on the platform. You know what I say to that? It's quality, not quantity. I, in fact, don't like to see somebody that has 20,000 connections because it means they're not real. LinkedIn is meant to be a tool to connect people. And if you don't know people with whom you're connected, how can you connect them? <laughs> so, you know, for example, I never accept a connection if I have no idea who they are. If I if they can't identify how I know them, whether it be we met at an event, and I forgot like, oh, yeah, or if they work with somebody I know, or if they're related to somebody I know, I never accept the connection because First, if it's a, it's a reflection of me, I don't know who this person is. And if I'm connected to somebody who's got a pretty storied past, mm -hmm. that does not look good for my brand. Um, on the flip side, I get asked a lot, hey, I noticed you're connected to Kenna. Uh, do you think you could foster an introduction? If I know Kenna, and I know this person, I will do it. That's what LinkedIn is for. So there are different methodologies. Some people just use it for marketing and that's fine. That's fine. If you wanna build that number to 20,000, go for it. And then you'll get more people through marketing. I don't discourage that at all. But if you are using it for LinkedIn, don't be sad that you've only got four or five people. If they're quality people that you can leverage for networking, then you're on the right track. Excellent. Okay, so I think what we'll do now is let's um, move to the second um, of Emily's presentations. So um, I'll ask Kenna and Joel to turn off your cameras and mute yourself. Um, I do want to encourage the attendees to continue putting in your questions, any questions that you have. There may be questions related to Emily's second presentation, but if you also still have some on networking and LinkedIn, put those in there and we'll try to get to all of the questions at the end. So hand it back over to- All right. Well, let's get into interviewing. This is going to be a fun one because I'm going to use a lot of examples and hopefully you can walk away with some tips, whether it be for interviewing or just being on camera in a meeting or what have you. When it comes to interviewing, I, I want those of you that are uh, listening to remember this isn't just about you being interviewed. These tips are for people doing the interviewing as well. There's an old cliche saying, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. That is a fact. You get one shot for that first impression. That's why LinkedIn is so important. But when you're talking to somebody as being interviewed, that's important. But Interviewing is a two-way street. If you are representing your company and you show up on an interview looking like a slob and ill-prepared and there's a dog barking in the background, what does that tell me about your company? So I want you to wear both hats when we're going through this. Interviewing uh, can be one person face-to-face. -face. Sometimes it's a panel. I've had as many as nine people on one interview for one candidate. So that can be a little more tricky, but I think all these tips that I'm going to give you are going to help you see this through. And keep in mind, interviewing via video is a whole new game, if you will. It is very different via live video. Why? Because all eyes are on you and only you. Just like you're all looking at me right now. If we were in a conference room, I might walk the room. I might look out the window. People are walking by. There are a lot of distractions when you are in person and in an office or an interview environment. On video, this is it. So any move you make, anything you say, how you appear will be noticed more so than if you are in person. So what I'm going to do here is talk about do's and don'ts. Let's start with the do's. Before your interview, just like Joel talked about preparing to go to a networking event, you have to prepare for the interview. What do I mean by that? Learn everything you can about the company. Make sure you look at recent news stories that might be in their press section of their website so you are up to date on what the company is doing. Websites make it really easy for you to learn everything you need to know. Learn about the interviewer. 
I just told you about LinkedIn, but if they aren't on LinkedIn, they're probably on their website. It might be a teacher and teachers are usually listed somewhere on a website or you can Google their name and find them somewhere. But for the most part, if it's a company they and they're pretty senior, they'll be on the company website as well. Learn what you can. And even better is if you can somehow identify with something on their profile. I'll give you an example. Kenna and I went to college together two years apart. I had no idea she was in Boston. No idea. Yet here we are through networking. So, you know, I, I use that example because you just never know when you're going to run into somebody or see something that identifies you as a, a connection to somebody. So learn about the interviewer. Next, study the job description. Make sure you look at the buzzwords that are in the job description. Passionate, detail-oriented, uh, self-starter. Pull out a few of those words and make sure you use them in your interview. Also, make sure you have examples of things you've done that align with what the job description says. You know, seeking somebody that has proven track record in managing a restaurant of 50 people. Well, tell them about your experience managing a restaurant of 50 people. So make sure that you study the job description, uh, have really good questions ready to go. A couple of examples are things like, how will you measure my success after the first year? What do you think is going to be the most important area for me to focus in the first 30 days? Tell me about your onboarding and training programs, things like that, and test your technology. What I mean by this is before your live interview, make sure that your technology works test it the day before. Usually it's Zoom or LinkedIn, I'm sorry, Zoom or Teams. This is a Zoom platform. My company uses Teams. Zoom is funky on my tablet. Zoom does not like working on a Microsoft tablet. That's why it's all wonky. And you know, a good thing I tested the camera before we got on because who knows what would have happened there. Make sure your camera works, make sure the Wi-Fi connection is strong, and make sure you test the microphone. So finally, before the interview, while you're testing, I want you to choose a background. There are really a few different ways you can go. This, what I have here, is what I call blurred, uh, a specific image that's blurred. It's got my company logo. You saw that um, Joel also had, as did Beth, their company logos. But then you had Kenna, who looks like she's in a home office, but the back is blurred, which looks great. Then you've got people that are just as is. Their background looks really tidy and neat, and they are fine having that as their background. But test it with somebody. Get somebody you trust to validate for you that the background looks good the way that you have it. So the day of the interview, dress appropriately. People think that just because you're behind a camera and not in person that you can dress down, you can dress casually. That is not true. Let's go back to what I said before. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. How you dress is a reflection of who you are. You want to dress according to what type of job it is you are interviewing for. So if you're interviewing for something that's a professional job, dress professionally. If you are a male, usually you, you want to know, should I wear a tie? Should I wear a jacket? At the very least, I would always recommend you wear a collared shirt and a jacket if you have one. If you don't have one, then a collared shirt and a tie would be very nice. Or if you don't have that, just a nice collared shirt. But whatever it is you're wearing, make sure it's clean and crisp and really look sharp on video. You don't want something that's really loud and obnoxious either. You don't need to deter from the fact that this person's gonna be looking at you the whole time and their eyes are gonna go crazy looking at something that's loud and, and really difficult to look at. So dress appropriately. I'd say for women, like I'm wearing a shell and a jacket, I might sometimes wear a, a sweater over this, but uh, a blouse could be nice, but don't go too casual. That's my suggestion. And if you're working with a recruiter, ask the recruiter. 
usually a recruiter is going to be coming to you saying, hey, I want you to work at this company. Before the interview, I want you to ask, what would it be appropriate for me to wear on the interview? And let them tell you so that you are set up for success. Dial in at least five minutes early. Uh, beware of your body language. You don't want to be sitting like this or leaning on the chair. Again, it's a reflection of you. You, you also want to try to sit still if you can. Uh, there's nothing worse than when I'm trying to interview and somebody's all over the place. Another thing that's really tough is if it's on a phone and you're holding your phone and it shakes. I literally get dizzy when that happens. So beware of your body language. And I'll also say beware of how your phone or tablet is set up. Don't have it on your lap, prop it up so that you're not touching it so it doesn't do this the whole time. So body language, very, very important. Make video contact with your eyes. I'm looking right into the camera right now. So many people look over here, they're looking away and and, and that just gives an image of uh, either you are scared to death and maybe that is the case and that's okay, that happens. But eye contact is really important because people can tell a lot from your eyes and from your presentation by how you're uh, showing your face and your reactions to certain things. So do your best to make video eye contact where the camera is, not where you think it is, where the camera is. Next, follow up appropriately after your interview. I recommend a very short and sweet thank you email within 24 hours. Dear Emily, thank you for taking the time to interview me today. I believe I could add value to your company. I look forward to hearing about next steps. Sincerely, Beth, that's all you need. If you want to put a little more, like identify something in there that, that speaks to what they said, like if they said, we need somebody who's really detail oriented, you can say, I believe my skill in being highly detail oriented would prove to be a good asset for your company. But short and sweet, you don't need to write something this long. No one has time to read that. Handwritten thank you notes are nice, but they get to the person like a week or two later. I will do a handwritten thank you note if it's a really high professional type of organization, maybe at the very end of the process, but handwritten thank you notes are a little bit in the past. So I would hate for you not to get your thank you recognized. Here are the don'ts folks. Don't be late to the interview. If you are going to be late, you have to shoot an email to the person and you should have their email because you got a meeting invite or somehow got an email telling you that you have an interview. So, or text somehow, whatever means they reached out to you, reach out to them. I am so sorry I got stuck in traffic. I am going to be five minutes late or I have a family emergency. I'm going to be late. Don't just be late. It is considered unacceptable these days. And it's also just not respectful of the person that took the time to, to put time on their calendar to meet with you. Don't have any distractions nearby. Uh, and I put pets on here. I've had more dogs barking, cats on keyboards. I had a woman that had four parakeets flying around her head during the interview. Even little babies can be very, very distracting. Sometimes you, there's nothing you can do. You have a child, you may want to tell the interviewer, my daycare counsel today, I have a two-year-old, I'm doing my best, but she might run into the room. And if she does, I apologize. Hey, you've cleared the air, but try not to have distractions. Don't avoid looking into the camera. I can't stress that more. The more that you do this, the more the person's going to think you're not interested or don't want to look them in the eye for some reason. Don't be too casual during the interview. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, it's fine. Just because you watch you know, videos on, on uh, YouTube and you're talking to friends or taking pictures on Snapchat or looking at uh, you know, Instagram doesn't mean that you can be that casual in how you present yourself on an interview. You have to show up to this camera interview via video like you are in person. You wouldn't slouch in person, so don't slouch in the interview. Don't use filler words. This is the biggest coaching I give to people that interview at all levels. Most of the people I interview are executives and I spend a lot of time coaching them through this after I've interviewed with them if I really think they've got a shot at a job. A lot of people um, will think um, and pause and say, um, or they'll say, right? 
I, I went to the store today, right? I had this job, right? Or it's like, da, 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 like, da, 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 you know, those filler words are very distracting when all I'm doing is looking at you and listening to you. And in most interviews where it's noticeable, it's usually about 50 times they will say it. And then I stop the interview and say, I'm going to give you some life coaching right now. If you use filler words, um, right, like, you know, any of those, uh, get some coaching on how to pause instead. If you don't have the answer, instead of, um, just pause. It's more powerful, actually. <clears throat> don't forget to say thank you at the end of the interview. <clears throat> Even if you're pressed for time. Hey, I just want to say a quick thanks. I appreciate you taking the time. The only other thing that I want to say is use good judgment. And I say that I'm going to leave you with one example. I had a candidate for a pretty senior job in human resources interview for a job on the mass turnpike in the breakdown lane at eight o'clock in the morning. How did I know that he was on the mass turnpike? Because I saw the exit sign over his head. I said, are you on the mass turnpike? Yeah, yeah, but I'm safe. And I was like, uh, I think we should stop the interview. Within 10 seconds, there's a bang on the window. It was a state trooper telling him to get the heck out of the breakdown lane. And guess what? I never spoke to that candidate again. So with that, use good judgment. You can't ever go wrong doing that. And I am going to hand it back to Beth. Excellent. Thank you, Emily. And I invite Joel and Kenna to turn their cameras back on and join us <coughs> Excuse me, for our next session. So that was um, very interesting. Um, <laughs> I have um, thankfully been in my role for a long time, so I have not had to do a virtual interview. Um, but I'm curious to know from um, Joel and Kenna, have you had any experiences um, recently <laughs> with now some virtual interviews of maybe some experiences you'd like to share that went well or maybe not so well? The Mass Turnpike, that's an interesting one. Mm. Well, I have a simplistic one, but it, you'll be surprised how how often it causes problems. Time zone changes. Mm -hmm. So if someone is in Texas and we're here in Boston and you set up your interview or a meeting for a certain time, please, people, make sure that you know which time zone it's in because I've been on the side of missing a time and I've also been on the receiving end of someone missing a time. So that one for me is always something I try to remember. That's Sorry. great. And I think now it post COVID so many more jobs are remote that yes. people are interviewing for positions that are in other, in other states in possibly other countries where they didn't before. So exactly. yeah, that becomes more of a challenge than it was before. Um, Joel, any examples yeah. of I want to just add, sometimes we focus on um, the answers, right? We, we, we know that they're, they're going to be asking questions, and we forget that uh, we also have the ability to ask questions. And so for that reason, you know, it's good to find information about the company, about the position, uh, you know, it, it's a, a wealth of information that you can uh, get from uh, the company before you get there, and and what is going to make you stand out from everyone else that is going to interview for that position. So, uh, what is it going to make that person or, or that team remember you uh, from everyone else that, that may be interviewing that day, that week, or that month? Uh, so that that's uh, what I have to add to that. I would build Excellent. on that and also say um, you you made a great comment about. Um, the answers, you're so focused on the answers, but also don't be so focused on the answers that you don't listen to the questions. Um, it And yeah. be very careful about that. Um, and, and it can be, you can learn a lot just by listening. So there's a balance. Excellent. Um, we do have a question from one of our attendees. And again, I will encourage everyone, if you have any questions, please um, submit them in through the, the Q&A. Um, how do I handle why I left my last job if I was terminated? Good question. I can take that one. I think it depends on why you were terminated. If it was a situation where the company struggled because of COVID or downturn or the company was purchased, just call it out and say exactly what happened. That is often happening more than you would have ever imagined. 
Uh, a lot of companies struggled through COVID and just didn't make it, and there had to be layoffs. There are a lot of layoffs going off right now, by the way, and that's nothing you can control. So the other thing is, though, if you are saying I was laid off, I would make sure if it was an amicable situation that you say that. I was laid off, but it was due to cost cutting in the company, and my manager said she'd be happy to be a reference. I want to hear from you that you left on good terms, because if you try to hide that, I'm going to question why you left. And guess what? I'll find out why you left. Sometimes people leave because it wasn't the right fit or they leave on their own because they didn't really agree with the leadership. And that's okay too. Sometimes I actually compliment people for leaving something that they hated. But it's how you describe how you left and why you left. If you say, my boss was such a jerk, I couldn't stand working with them, Ugh, I had to get out of there. What sounds better, that or I really enjoyed my eight months at the company. I learned a lot. I think I added a lot of value. And honestly, it came to a point where my manager and I just were thinking in different ways. And I felt it made more sense for us to part ways than for us to try to battle through it. So that's why I left. So choose your words wisely. Yeah. So there actually is a question that someone posed, which is kind of along those lines, Emily, but I'll just pose it in case you mm -hmm. want to add any extra comments. How do I handle why I left if I chose to leave a company without having a new job? So it's oh, sort gosh. of along those same lines. Yeah. I've left every company that I've ever worked for without another job. Everyone, go look at my go look at my LinkedIn. There's always a gap and I'm on my fifth career. So that means I've left five, four significant jobs without another job. If you're interviewing for a company and they wonder why you're not working, I would question, is this the company you want to be working for? Like, you don't, it's not, to, well, it depends. It's not necessarily a bad sign that you left without another job. People do it all the time. But why is what you have to be ready to answer? And it's got to be a good answer. In my case, in every job I've had, I gave it my all. I wanted to exit on good terms. I didn't want to interview behind my boss's back because they would have found out. And I wanted to breathe and figure out what I wanted to do next. That's why I left. A lot of people leave for childcare. They want to be with their families. Sometimes it's medical reasons. Sometimes it's an elderly parent. Don't be afraid to leave without another job or talk about it as long as you put it in a positive light. Excellent. Um, we do have another question from our attendees. Um, when interviewing out of high school, do your grades matter? Is that different for colleges? And if so, how can you explain that quarantine through quarantine through us all for a loop. That sounds like someone whose grades may not have been where they wanted them to be. Do the so grades really matter? Take that one. So, so if you have good grades, you know, I would add that in there. Uh, you know, at the college level, for example, we, we talk about average of the GPA, right? And and when is it acceptable to post that or to add it to your LinkedIn profile mm -hmm. or your resume? Uh, you know, I would say focus on volunteering opportunities, and you can also leverage that. Uh, you know, coming out of high school, what have you done outside of just going to school? And you can you can actually, uh, you know, take those volunteering opportunities and, and say, yes, I actually had, I don't have experience, but I actually volunteer at, the, at you know, this institution or, or this company. And, and there I was able to uh, work on this uh, customer service skill or develop this uh, new tool. And, and, and what have you, what difference do you make there? Uh, another important point that I want to make is, you know, when when do you interview as well? And and I think that you know sometimes we're thinking about the interview when you go in into the uh, uh, appointment or when you have that scheduled uh, time with the with the interviewee interviewer, but um, you actually are inter being interviewed on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, when you go to work, uh, people are noticing your work ethic. Uh, they know, uh, you know, there may be someone that you're working from another team or a different company or uh, different ways. And so you are actually uh, interviewing for a position every day that you work, even though you don't, you may not know about it. And, and so, you know, just keep that in mind, uh, you know, as Emily alluded to earlier, 
uh, dress for success. Uh, make sure that that you are, uh, you know, speaking uh, appropriately, and and that you are not, uh, you know, speaking negatively about the company that you're working for, because people listen to what you say. And so you just want to make sure that you are uh, staying positive and, and know that someone is listening and you never know who may be giving you that opportunity uh, to work for a different company. Excellent. Thanks. Um, I have another question. How do you respond if someone says you're overqualified because you're trying to sort of break into a new field? How would you address that? I would I focus I on what you're good at. So regardless of whether you're overqualified or not, um, it, the, the best tactic is to focus on your capabilities, your strengths, what you bring to the table. You may very well be overqualified, but you can also address it head on, especially if they say, well, why would you take a job that's way below where you're really qualified to be? Well, I would take this job because I am dying to be in this industry. And I'm willing to do anything to get into it. Um, I am happy to, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm happy to file files. We don't really file files anymore, but you get the point. Um, Electronically, it, it, we do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Electronic file file. Um, but it, it always focus on your strengths in that situation. Never sell yourself short because you're trying to change industries. If Excellent. I can add to that, yeah. um, I, I look at it from a different angle because I am hired by clients to find very, very specific roles. And just yesterday, I had to turn a woman away because she was overqualified. Being overqualified can be a little scary for somebody looking to hire because they could get really bored really fast. Now, the situation here was it was the same industry. So Kenna, you're thinking around moving different industries, I spot am. on. You gotta yeah. get your foot in the door somehow. I mean, I started in the energy industry in one of the lowest level sales management roles possible. That's how I started. I started out of Cornell waitressing at a restaurant. That was my first job. And it was the greatest job ever. Look where I am now. So, you know, I say that because sometimes when somebody says you are overqualified, you just might be, and it might not be the right fit. And the client is worried you're going to get bored and you're probably also taking less money. And so the next time a job comes along that sounds more exciting and pays more money, you're going to be out the door. If it's a new industry, however, you got to start somewhere. So that's what I would say to that. Can I add Excellent. one more thing uh, to that, Emily? So, so one thing that we also uh, sometimes do not do is is uh, tailor that resume to that specific position. Mm, good point. And, and, and so, if you have the same resume for everything that you're applying for, that may not work. Uh, mm -hmm. You may be applying for a position uh, in the healthcare industry. Uh, you know, make sure that you put that summary. Uh, you change that around specifically for that uh, company or that position that you're applying for. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, we have another question that was submitted in. This is a good one. This one I'm always, I struggle with myself. How do you handle the salary expectation question? Mm, good one. Why don't I take that one? And I do want to say, I know this ends at eight. We have, as panelists, agreed to stay on longer. If you have to leave, we will not be offended. But if you want to stay, we will stay until the questions are answered. Salary expectations. Well, a beautiful thing that has happened in the United States is uh, laws around equal pay. And the reason these laws have come about is mostly because of parity is what we call it between um, certain ethnicities and those that aren't of that ethnicity and men and women. And so the governments decided to, to level the playing field and make it such that we legally cannot ask you how much you currently make. All we can ask you is what are your expectations? And in the state of Massachusetts, it has gotten especially um, strict for people that are doing hiring to protect you all who are asking for, for trying to get jobs. How do you answer the question? Well, a couple of ways. First of all, some states now require that the salary range be in the job posting. So look for that. Um, the second thing is you don't have to answer the question. You legally can ask them, what is the salary range for this role? And they have to tell you. 
They have to legally tell you. The range is between $75,000 and $90,000. And then you have to decide, is that within the range or not? Now, sometimes you're in a more professional um, part of your career. You're, you're more seasoned. You know, let's say that you're my age. Uh, the question will be answered a little bit differently. So I'm not sure who asked it, what sort of where they are in their career. But sometimes as a recruiter, I will say, look, I don't want to know how much you're making. I don't want to know. Uh, you can't, don't tell me you don't have to legal and I don't want to know. But what I do need to know is this. What would it take to pull you out of your current company and move you into this other one? What is that? If you know the bonus is 20%. What does the base salary have to be in order for you to make that jump? And most people will give a range. Now, you should also be doing your homework a little bit in advance. Robert Half puts out a salary guide. It's right on the website for most traditional jobs in finance and accounting, technology, marketing, um, administrative roles, you name it salary guide and it, it's for the whole united states it has a cost of living differential in the back do your homework this tells you the 25th percentile 50th 75th 95th percentile and you know what uh when we send out the follow-up email i will see if we can put a link to the salary guides because it's all in here do your homework on what you believe the role should be paid because if you come in and the role is being paid a hundred thousand and you think you're worth two hundred fifty thousand i'm gonna laugh and probably end the interview so my feedback to you is go in armed with what you think it should be if they ask you you may ask what the range is and then you make the decision on if it's going to be a good fit or not or feel free to just say i'm seeking to be at a hundred thousand dollars for my base is that within the range? And if they say no, say, well, what is within the range? But don't sell yourself short, you know? Yeah. So that's what um, I would say. Emily, does your company also have um, any resources for coaching services? You did mention that, um, you know, if you say um or like or right, which yeah, I've probably yeah, done yeah, a million yeah. times tonight. Uh, um, no. There I go. They don't have any resources. I can okay. certainly be of help. If you are having really a bad time, figure out how to get a hold of me, do your networking, and I'd be happy to spend five minutes coaching you through how to stop saying um or like. And I don't know, I might even say something if I do. I hope somebody on this panel will tell me, but I'd be happy to help <laughs> these folks out. Well, can Excellent. I add something to, to that question? So, so in terms of the salary range, uh, one thing to keep in mind is, how, you know, some people have asked me, how, how do I get to that? Um, you know, the range is from 70,000 to 90,000. How do I get to that 90,000, mm -hmm. right? So if you think about how do you prepare yourself for that um, position or that salary, uh, you know, part of it is education. Part of it is experience. Part of it is, you know, might be how, what are the uh, current employees making, you know, your potential coworkers, what are they making? So you want to make sure that you are, uh, you know, we talked about your brand and, and, and how you prepare yourself. Uh, that you work on those items because if you want to make the most out of that or get as closer to that um, salary, the, the upper range, then you want to make sure that you cover all those bases. And can I make one more point on the salary question? Salary isn't just the base salary. Companies offer a whole package. And you've got to also make sure you ask about the whole package. For example, uh, a company might have a lower base salary, but they might cover 100% of your health insurance, which might save you $10,000. So you might be worried about 5,000 in the salary, but it's saving you uh, 10,000 on the insurance. Maybe there's a 401k with a 10% match. Uh, some companies do uh, spot bonuses that they don't put in writing, but they do them. So I say this because it's not just all about the base salary. And I should have mentioned this early on. When asked about the salary, I would say, can you give me a basic idea of, of the, the, the overarching package so that I can get a gist for, do you offer health insurance, do you have 401k and all the standard benefits? Because if so, I think I'll be better prepared to give you an answer. So just think about the compensation as a whole package and not just your base or your base and bonus. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Okay, so why don't we wrap it up with one final question that um, each of you may want to answer. So sort of what are the top things to you that make a candidate stand out over other candidates? 
what is something that really leaves a lasting impression for you? Anyone want to take that? I can take it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so for me, I, you know, I'm looking for someone that's that's uh, unique, uh, someone that is not, um, uh, you know, that's that is not uh, trying to be someone who they are not. Uh, you know, as I interviewed, just looking for some uh, um, a transparency as well as as you know, depending on the role and the position that I'm interviewing for. Uh, but just trying to, you know, Emily uh, mentioned something earlier. Just say like it is. Right. Don't try to sugarcoat it or, or um, you know, hide things. Just come out and, and tell me how things are, because ultimately you can work on certain things. You don't have to be uh, the best uh, candidate in terms of, you know, your your education or experience. Uh, but, you know, you're looking for that connection. Right. And we spoke about uh, networking earlier and how you can connect and, and try to find some common ground uh, and also thinking about the team. Right. So I'm, I'm thinking about how is this person going to uh um work along with uh, the rest of the team is this a good fit uh is this going to be a, a problem uh you know thinking about personalities and, and things of that nature so you're looking at the whole picture um you know I would, I would say just looking for someone who is themselves uh transparent uh unique and that is able to also bring something to the team uh so that we can build on the culture that we have already at the uh, at the hospital excellent um, and I, Emily mentioned earlier, and I, I could not agree anymore, um, I, confidence, come in and whether you're in person or you're on video, have confidence in yourself, you know, have confidence in whatever it is your background is and whoever it is that you are as a person, look me in the eye, engage in the conversation, listen to what I'm asking, don't, don't jump just to whatever you want to respond with, listen to what I'm actually asking. Um, and I find that is a really interesting candidate to me. Excellent. For me, it really goes to, to three things. I think you said the top three things. One of them is going back to the basics. Be on time, dress appropriately, do your homework, check those boxes to begin with. I tell you, if you're late and you didn't call me, if you look like a slob, if you know nothing about the company or the job, don't even bother talking to me because it won't be worth my time or yours. Check the boxes. Uh, the second thing is how much do you know about the job and about the company? I say do your homework, but now I really mean as a second thing, study. Finish sentences that I'm wowed that you are finishing. Tell me that if, if you're meeting with a CEO that you watched their TED talk on something. Uh, tell me that you read in the paper that the company that you're interviewing for just went public. Tell me that you did your homework. And then finally, I agree, I think it was Joel that said authenticity, being yourself. Don't try to be who you think the company wants you to be, be who you are. And that will more times than not get you further in the process than trying to emulate somebody that you think you should be that you're really not. That's what I would leave you with. Excellent. Well, I think that is a great way to end our session tonight. So I want to thank everyone, all of our attendees, and very specifically our panelists. Um, special thanks to Emily for your amazing content and Kenna and Joel for participating in our panel. Um, I think we covered a lot of really great topics. I learned a lot, um, which was great. And so we will be sending a follow-up email to all of our registered attendees um, with information about the session, I believe the recording, and we'll see if we can get some of um, the resources from Emily's um, organization. So again, I want to thank everyone for joining tonight and um, I hope everyone has a great rest of your evening.